Welcome to the Alternative Marketplace. Uh, whether you're streaming or watching us on Business Day TV, DSTV Channel 412, it's great to have you with us in this new hybrid world that we're inhabiting. And investments are no different. One needs hybrids or diversification during times of rising public market volatility, rising inflation and interest rates and geopolitical tensions. Uh, and that is certainly what Africa's largest alternative investment conference aims to offer you over the course of the next few hours uh, around the world in response to first the global financial crisis and then the COVID pandemic. Central banks have provided extraordinary stimulus to the economy in recent years through low interest rates, asset purchases uh, and even the rarely used helicopter money via stimulus checks in the US and other jurisdictions. And it's boosted almost all asset prices and uh, may have broken down some of the traditional correlations between bonds and equities and investors have been finding it increasingly difficult to find assets that achieve their required return because all of this liquidity has pushed up asset prices making it an expensive time to be investing and uh, with the pandemic and political uncertainties the risks associated with those assets most influenced by factors such as interest rate movements are elevated at the moment the market was concerned before the Omicron variant that uh, the velocity of all of this money would accelerate to produce long-term inflation. And it's still a significant risk. Structural inflation could create a turning point in interest rates and the geopolitical tensions that have caused a spike in commodity prices have served to amplify the fear over inflation. And this is where the rise of alternatives comes in. Alternatives can play a role in protecting investors' wealth amid such turbulence, uh, but careful thought is required, particularly around portfolio construction and asset selection, as not all alternatives have the same characteristics leaving cryptocurrencies and other lesser known strategies to one side for the moment. Alternatives consist of hedge funds, non-investment grade debt, private credit, private equity and real assets such as property and infrastructure. Now to varying degrees all of these asset classes provide some form of diversification to mainstream markets and global economic growth. Uh, combining them can provide exposure to factors that are not found in traditional asset classes as well as the much sought after manager skill. Now one needs diversification during these times uh, uh, especially and we've got windows into the world of hedge funds private markets structured products disruptive technology PE and uh, VC markets as well as cryptocurrency and emerging markets and more as we play host to some of the leading alternative investment fund managers on the African continent some housekeeping for our streamers please keep your questions coming through and if you're watching the good old-fashioned way uh, whip out your smartphone and join the conversation we'd love to hear from you uh, and and you can ask questions in the chat box. And in addition, if you want to schedule a meeting, go onto the website. Uh, you can schedule a meeting with any of the presenters today, right here. Now, Safira is an emerging markets uh, dedicated investment boutique based in London. Safira manages liquid strategies marrying concentrated portfolios with a risk management approach tailored to uh, EM's intricacies. And there are a lot of those at the moment, as we see with what's unfolding around uh, Russia and Ukraine. Jason uh, Mitra is the firm's CIO and has been managing risk in emerging markets for the better part of the last 26 odd years. Without giving too much of your age away there, Jason, over to you. Hi, and uh, thank you. Um, uh, my name is uh, Jason Mitra. I'm the CIO and founder of Safira. Uh, we're a London-based EM uh, boutique. Uh, we manage liquid, uh, long-only and uh, long-short money uh, for institutions and high net worth individuals. Um, uh, the firm has been in existence since 2017, although the team has been together for a decade. And, uh, and we all have uh, many, many years of experience uh, navigating the, uh, the volatility and challenges uh, presented by uh, by the uh, the array of uh, emerging markets that we uh, that we uh, focus on from Latin America to um, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Africa, and uh, and the Far East. Um, our uh, our USP is that we run a, a highly concentrated portfolio of, uh, of stocks, uh, typically fifteen to thirty long investments and uh, twenty five to forty shorts, uh, drawn from a, uh, a fairly narrow universe of only two hundred potential longs in our universe of stocks that we cover and 150 or so uh, potential shorts uh, drawn from a, a much wider universe of 10,000 plus potential stocks. Um, uh, and and the, the key criteria for us uh, that we focus on is, is, is liquidity. Um, uh, for us, external risk in emerging markets can often overwhelm you know, the, the merits of a fantastic bottom-up 
uh, uh, stock picking thesis, and, uh, and we need to be able to recalibrate and adjust the, the size and shape of our portfolio to adapt to the uh, to the volatility that is uh, uh, a characteristic of, of, of emerging market investments. Um, our objective is to deliver equity like returns over, over the cycle with uh, lower levels of volatility, and, uh, and our strategies have uh, delivered that uh, for the best part of a decade now. Um, we have a, a team of eight, uh, six members of the investment team. Uh, within that investment team, two dedicated risk managers and, and quant, which gives you a sense of the, the attention we pay to, to, to risk management. Uh, and, uh, and we feel that the process that we follow uh, delivers an output, which is uh, quite different to that of our peers. Uh, this, this first slide that I'll show you here uh, uh, it shows uh, the large uh, gold dot is, 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 the, is, is the performance of our uh, long strategy uh, versus uh, the entire universe of global emerging market long funds, uh, peers taken from the investment database. And you'll see two things here. One is, is, is pleasingly the, the return profile is, uh, is, is up there with the best in class, um, uh, uh, towards the, the top end of the grid, uh, uh, but also that our beta to MSCI emerging markets uh, is, is relatively low at, at, at around uh, 0 0.55. Uh, so there is something in the makeup of our portfolio which gives us a, a, a lower beta to, uh, to, to, to broader markets, uh, but allows us still to deliver best in class returns over, over time. Um, and and, and, and it, part of the uh, explanation for that is the, is the quality and, uh, of, of, the, of the stocks that we, that we invest in. Uh, so we have a, a degree of, uh, of protection uh, to, to returns from the, the quality of the investments that we, that we choose. Uh, another differentiated uh, characteristic of our, of our strategy is, uh, is, is our low correlation to, to China, which obviously makes up uh, over a third of uh, emerging markets right now. And for, for much of the last uh, four or five years uh, has, has dominated returns given the, 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 the phenomenal momentum of, uh, of Chinese internet strategies, which have obviously fallen out of favor somewhat over the last six months or so. Um, uh, and, and, and that speaks to the construction of our, of our portfolio. We are absolutely benchmark agnostic um, and, uh, and, uh, and regard the opportunity set of markets away from China as, as, as valid as, as that of the benchmark dominating country. Um, and you'll see in a moment that, uh, that a, a significant proportion of our allocation returns comes from off the beaten track uh, geographies, Greece, Mexico, uh, Peru, Egypt, uh, Indonesia, uh, the Philippines and so forth. Uh, and and, and it, it is natural that we would, would expect to find um, uh, greater pricing inefficiencies in these geographies that are less well analyzed by the investment banking community and, and, and uh, garner less attention from uh, either a domestic or international asset management community. Um, in our long short manifestation um, strategy, uh, we have a, a, a pretty decent uh, track record of which we're proud of, of managing returns uh, during uh, moments of market distress. Um, since the strategy uh, came into existence in 2017, uh, the gold bars illustrate our fund's um, strategy's performance um, uh, during the most severe market downturns that we've seen over those times. Uh, so a, a pretty good um, uh, uh, experience during uh, moments of, of distress. Uh, you know, where we, uh, we are fully invested uh, ourselves as, as managers in, in these, in these um, strategies. And, uh, and our objective in the in long short is to uh, is to protect capital uh, uh, during during periods of distress. Uh, another characteristic of our portfolios is, is valuation. We are not outright value investors, uh, but we like to anchor uh, the, the the portfolio in in a predictable and understandable uh, valuation. Uh, the the uh, gold bar is the trailing PE of our portfolio versus the blue bar. Um, uh, the, that of the S&P clearly uh, quite expensive uh, right now, and then that of, uh, of MSCI emerging markets and, and uh, China, uh, which has recently derated. And I would say that at the moment there is a, a clear uh, valuation opportunity uh, for China emerging markets in our portfolio versus that of the developed, de developed world. And, and when one thinks about the, the policy set in front of us right now, uh, the, the US and Europe uh, at the end of an economic cycle at the limits of monetary easing, or, or, or I would say, are, are almost forced to, uh, to 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 raise interest rates to contain inflation. And at the, at the end of uh, their fiscal tethers following COVID, uh, we look at the emerging world at a, at a quite a different state uh, across the world, 
uh, emerging world, we've seen you know, a, 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 a fairly steady rate, rate um, uh, raising of interest rates over the last few quarters, which leaves us with quite a strong monetary buffer in many parts of the EM world, and uh, and uh, a clear room for fiscal expansion, uh, most notably actually in, in, in China right now. So quite different valuations and uh, and quite different uh, periods of, of the cycle to confront the the, the big geopolitical challenges that uh, that markets face uh, right now. Um, when we look at uh, our portfolio construction, as I mentioned, you know, our, our, uh, our returns uh, are, have been driven by quite off the beaten track uh, geographies. Uh, the, the, uh, the, long, uh, the gold bars illustrate the returns of our long portfolios, uh, the blue bars of our, of our shorts. Uh, and you'll see that the, the, the greatest part of the return has come from the likes of Mexico, uh, Greece, which is only 0.3% of the EM benchmark, uh, India, Peru, and elsewhere, China, something of, a, uh, of, 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 of an also that. Uh, and similarly, in terms of sector allocations, uh, we, we have tended to focus on uh, sectors that benefit from the, the natural uh, tailwind of emerging markets, which is uh, penetration and demographics, which would lead us to have uh, uh, a, a structurally higher allocation to consumer uh, and, and financials, which in, in the emerging world are often uh, interlinked with, with, with uh, the expansion of consumption, credit cards, auto finance, mortgages, and, and, and so forth. Uh, less exposure over time to uh, more cyclical, more volatile sectors such as uh, industrials and, uh, and, and materials. Um, uh, in, ter in terms of exposures, uh, you'll see uh, our, our, our current allocations are, uh, are, are somewhat skewed for the first time, actually given the valuation opportunity towards, towards China. Um, uh, and that, that would be, I, I would guess, in, in a sort of contrarian fashion to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to many, many um, uh, global managers' opinions of, of that geography. Our view is that top down, uh, we are at, at, the room, at the beginning of a uh, quite substantial fiscal uh, expansion and with plenty of room for monetary easing as well. Uh, valuations are at absolute rock bottom. Uh, the Hang Seng uh, stock index, uh, for example, is trading uh, at a 10% discount to uh, the, the uh, 2020 COVID low. Uh, so uh, seriously distressed valuations there at, at, a, at a time when, um, when, uh, when uh, we're starting to see a stabilisation and actually recovery in economic activity, uh, almost the exact opposite of what we're seeing in, 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 in the developed world west. So, so for us, for the first time in, in, in four years, a significant allocation to, towards China, contrarian, uh, you, you might say. Uh, we also have exposure right now to, to Egypt, um, uh, particularly through fertilisers, which... Uh, which uh, uh, one, one might understand would be uh, um, uh, an attractive proposition given the uh, given the current embargo on exports of potash and so forth from from uh, Russia, uh, and then to India, Philippines, uh, Taiwan, uh, geographies that were late to un unlock from COVID and have a, a runway of consumption and uh, economic expansion as uh, as as the COVID experience uh, 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 phase a year or so later than we saw in in, in other parts of the developed world. Uh, that brings me to the end. Uh, so if there's any questions, I'd be happy to, uh, to take them. Well, so much to take in there, Jason. I think uh, uh, very interesting to see how you are positioning in China, considering how much attention China has received here in South Africa uh, through uh, NASPAS and Process, and they're obviously holding in, in Tencent, uh, and how much that has sold off and uh, derated over the last while. Emerging markets in general, though, are a notoriously volatile space. And we see with what's going on geopolitically uh, in the world at the moment, very difficult to navigate these waters. What's different in the way that Safira manages this risk? So, so we, we dedicate uh, a third of our uh, investment team to, to quantitative risk and, and, and risk management. Uh, and we have a, uh, a, a, a procedure which we've developed over the last decade that uh, effectively uh, forces us to handicap all of our potential investments according to an array of uh, external risks. Country risk is one of them. Uh, uh, the sector in which a business resides is another. For example, a mining company will be intrinsically more risky and volatile than a, than a, a staple business. And, and also the factor exposures that a, that a, a, a stock might bring. So uh, uh, the interest rate sensitivity of a, of a company, the FX sensitivity of a company, or the sensitivity to commodity prices, wheat or grain, all these external factors uh, we, we input into a risk management model and, uh, and uh, effectively handicap away from businesses that are significantly exposed to, to external or unpredictable risks. What that leads us to is a portfolio which is uh, highly idiosyncratic and really stands up on uh, and is scaled to uh, uh, the, the best 
a near-term idiosyncratic return profile that stocks can give us, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, taking significant external risk exposure, which is obviously un unpredictable and, and variable, as, as recent experience in, uh, in Eastern Europe has, uh, has, has, uh, has, has yeah. told us. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that because so often I think the misconception about hedge funds is they're inherently risky. There certainly are. I mean, if you think uh, of long-term capital management, there, there have been some risks and big blow-ups in the past. But uh, the good hedge funds, the ones that I've certainly come to know and respect, have always been acutely sensitive and aware of how they manage that risk. And I think this is a great example. Jason Mitra, CIO of Safira, an emerging markets dedicated investment boutique based in London, as we heard from some of the London traffic in the, uh, in the background there. Really a, a great way to kick us off here on the alternative marketplace on Business Day TV. After the break, uh, we continue uh, the hedge fund conversation with Lorium. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the 2022 Alternative Marketplace, Africa's home for the top investment managers in the alternative asset class space. And we're on to uh, our second manager after a great opening presentation from Safira, an excellent entry point into the world of hedge funds. Lorium Capital is an employee-owned boutique asset manager. It was founded back in 2008 and it's one of the leading hedge fund managers in South Africa with a 13-year track record. Lorium manages three hedge funds, a market-neutral hedge fund, a long-short hedge fund, and an aggressive long short hedge fund. In addition to hedge funds, Lorium also provides a suite of long only fund strategies in South Africa and the rest of Africa with total assets under management of 39 billion rand. And we're joined today by Murray Winkler, co founder and portfolio manager of Lorium Capital. Murray, over to you. Thanks, Michael, and good morning, everyone. A um, little bit about hedge funds and why you should be invested in hedge funds. Um, as Michael said, we've been going for 13 years. We run three and a half billion of hedge funds. We run 40 billion in total. Um, but hedge funds are very much underrepresented in South Africa. We have a team of 29 individuals. We have, th we have 13, uh, 15 on the investment side. And we're large enough to be relevant to people, but small enough to be nimble. So why use hedge funds? Um, firstly, I guess if you're a long only manager, all you can do is you either buy a stock if you like it, or you hold zero in the stock if you don't like it. Being a hedge fund, you can actually take it a little bit further. You've got more tools in your toolbox. So if we don't like a stock, let's assume it's ShopRite. ShopRite's trading at 220 Rand. We think it's too expensive. Um, we can then sell that share and hope to buy it back at a lower price. If we buy it back at 220, at 200, we actually end up making uh, an extra 10% um, by putting that position on. So there are some extra stuff you can do for very expensive shares. In addition to that, uh, we're able to hedge out our portfolio. We run with a lot of put options. Downside protection is something we do as well. Very important for hedge funds relative to long onies. And, and then being fully exposed in a long only fund, you have to sell something to buy something. Hedge funds, on the other hand, are able to just, because they sit on quite a bit of cash, at any time you can buy a share, sell a share, and you don't need to worry, worry about that. And your opportunity set is much bigger. So some of the myths out there in hedge funds are, um, they're not reg regulated, a black box. Um, that is true, that it has been some worries internationally, but South Africa is, is, is regulated by the FSCA. And we have been for five years now, six years. And so it's very tightly regulated in South Africa uh, under the Unit, the Unit Trust Act. In addition to that, the, um, hedge funds are seen as high risk, um, which is globally there are 9,000 hedge funds out there. Some of them are very high risk, some of them are moderate. But in South Africa as a whole, hedge funds being regulated are much lower risk. Um, so that is one of the things um, but it's quite different in, in South Africa. Um, the other thing is hedge funds don't add value. The fees are very high. Now, that's true. One in 20 um, with a cash hurdle is high, but you have to look at your net returns. So returns after deducting your fees. And the South African industry has done extremely well over time. And net of fees have matched the markets or beaten the markets at lower, lower levels of risk. 
So one of the big benefits of being in a hedge fund is downside protection and risk management. What we have in the uh, to my left is the two crises we've seen in the last in the last 15 years. One, f firstly, on, uh, firstly, far left is a global financial crisis, and we show the, the what the market did at that period. Overall, the SA market went down 37 percent during that crisis. Was the max drawdown you could have lost. And the average hedge fund in South Africa only went down by 15%. So there was a huge benefit to being in hedge funds. You didn't lose nearly as much money in that drawdown. We show over there the three, the three months where the markets went down pretty uh, fell sharply. You can see sort of the first bar chart negative there, the, the red one, minus nine. Then that was in, that was in July 2008. And then the next one was um, in September 2008 and October 2009. And those drawdowns were 13% and 10% in that month. We show the average long short fund um, in South Africa generally fell at about 2.5%. And the average market neutral was very flat during that period. So big downside protection um, by hedge funds. And then we have a look at the, the, the latest one, 2020, the COVID crisis. Um, again, the two months, February and, February and March. And you can see 9% downside for the market and 16% for downside for um, in, in, in the March month. And the average hedge fund was down probably about 7% in each month on average. So it protects on the downside, very beneficial. So where is the smart money invested? If we look globally, the hedge fund industry is four trillion dollars. Locally, we are a small amount of five billion dollars. So we are absolutely tiny. Now, all the endowment funds globally allocate hugely to hedge funds. Um, if you look at the Yale, uh, Princeton, Harvard, uh, Brown University, they, they are allocating somewhere around um, 20, between 20 and 35 percent of their allocations go to hedge funds. So we in South Africa are way behind uh, the game on this. A little example, um, a chart here shows the property index, which was extremely good over time and uh, great returns. Um, in, 2000, in 2016, it looked very expensive. We went short that, a couple of the stocks there, um, Resilient, Fortress, and the, it was a little bit early in going short, so we sold it with anticipation of, of buying the shares back. And what happened is the market then, you can see, in 2018 fell very sharply, fell by some 30%, and we profited from that, which long only manages all that could have been not in there. We made a lot of money from being short. Having a look at the hedge funds out there on the chart, we show the returns of our funds since inception, 1 August 2008. The diamond there, sh relative, we've beaten the all share index since inception at a third of the vol. At two thirds of the vol, and our market neutral has done the same return, slightly above at one third of the vol. And then, if we look uh, from two th when we started our aggressive hedge fund, how we've done on that, again, our aggressive fund has done double the market. This is all net of fees um, and the returns there. So, showing on a risk adjusted basis, very attractive returns. Lastly, just on positioning of our funds. Um, uh, our long book at the moment, we, we're sitting on some uh, British American tobacco, quite a few of the resources. Um, in the short book, we have very quite underweight banks at the moment, um, sort of relative to the index, and a couple of shorts in, in the retail space. And then we're on the long book, a couple of special situations like Steinhoff Prefs, um, some of the smaller industrials, in, Invicta, uh, Hudeca, etc. So that's just a little bit of flavor of the hedge funds and performance and saying have a closer look at them because we think for the industry as a whole in South Africa we should have a lot more money in the hedge funds and hopefully uh, some of that includes the Lorium funds. Murray Winkler, thank you very much. Uh, and it's very interesting to uh, hear that you short some of the banks at the moment. I, I'm going to take you aside and, and uh, unpack that thesis. But firstly, how did your hedge funds do over the last 12 months? 2021 was a very good year for us, and we'd been a bit pedestrian a few years before that. Um, but our aggressive hedge fund did net return of 49% after fees last year, and our main long short fund did 33%. Now, bear in mind the market itself did about 27%. So we were comfortably above in our main long uh, hedge fund, and in our aggressive one, we did extremely well. 
Now, you mentioned that there's still an under allocation to hedge funds in South Africa, you know, collective invest investment schemes at three trillion rand industry assets. Why do you think hedge funds still remain such a small allocation in the South African context? I think one of the things is um, the regulation for the industry, which only came about sort of that's five years ago. Um, and then, uh, then in terms of being on list platforms, um, it's, uh, it's not on all, it's getting on those platforms has been quite difficult. And then some of the, the IFAs um, not having licenses to sell the product has been an issue as well. So those have all held back the industry quite a bit. Um, nevertheless, um, it is in picking up, but there's still a long way to do go. And I think the complexity is another big issue, that, man that people out there don't fully understand hedge. So the trick on that is to look at the people with track records of 10 years plus. You can see the returns, you can see the vol, and there's a handful of guys who've been around in our industry that have got really good track records over 10 years plus. Um, mm -hmm. And those are the ones that, that one should look at with the history. Now, how much do you think investors should be allocating to non-traditional assets uh, like hedge funds and other alternatives? I, look, it's part of diver diversification, always very important. I think if you add a bucket of 10 to 20 percent to your hedge, fund, uh, hedge funds in your total portfolio, I mean, you see the Ivy League uh, universe endowment funds are doing 20 to 35. So 10 to 20 seems a pretty decent number for us. And if you put those in and you, you, then you look at the risk return profile by adding in your returns, um, your risk adjusted returns will, will, should definitely improve by doing that. So 10 to 20 is mm. the number we would think is, makes sense. And you said the challenges around the list platform. How can investors access your funds? The one easiest is to go onto our website. You can access directly. You can go onto Hollard. You can go onto uh, Glacier platform. But it's uh, probably the best is to get in touch with us, with, uh, with uh, um, at Lorium, Kim, Kim Hubner, who runs um, marketing in that, um, or just go straight onto the website and we can help you on that. Well, there you go, folks. Uh, hedge funds, I know for a while had a, a bad rap around fees. That certainly uh, isn't the case when you look at the returns that you get, uh, natal fees as well as, as gross. Uh, if you're allocating to the right investor and I think uh, Murray made that point look at those uh, look at those managers I should say with track records of 10 year plus that was Murray Winkler co-founder and portfolio manager of Lorium Capital an employee owned boutique asset manager as I said founded back in 2008 so it's been around for 13 years one of the leading hedge fund managers in the country stay tuned to the 2022 alternative marketplace Africa's home for the top investment managers in the alternative asset space after the break gel tech my next guest is here to talk about private markets and in particular pre-ipo investments as an alternative asset class for investors to consider before going public now although pre-IPO or secondary investments are, are well known in the developed markets. Uh, uh, this asset class is still fairly nascent here in South Africa. Geltech Equity Capital Investments is a pre-IPO investment vehicle created to provide access to this asset class for South African and other investors. And Roberto Ferrero is going to explain the investment opportunity in getting into pre-public listing. Uh, Roberto, over to you. Thank you, Michael. So today I'll be speaking about um, pre-IPO investments um, and what I mean by that is investments in large well capitalized private companies predominantly in the US seeking to list in the near to medium term and so what we offer um, as Geltec is an avenue for South African investors uh, to access US based pre-IPO shares in high growth disruptive innovation companies we also offer an opportunity uh, to co-invest with the world's leading venture capital and private equity investors. And some of these names um, are Sequoia, Andreessen Horowitz, uh, Axel, Founders Fund, Kleiner Perkins. Now, although these might not be household names uh, for, the, for our market, um, they are early stage and late stage investors um, in, in well-known names such as Google, um, Apple, uh, Instagram, Uber, etc. So that shows you the quality of these sorts of investments. 
Now, this is a, a slide which we think is quite compelling. It's really a slide indicating the post-IPO 12-month returns for a period between 2010 and 2020 for private market returns. On the left is uh, the returns for IPO investments um, made for investments made at the IPO point, and on the right um, are the investments from the last pre-IPO financing round. And you can see that investments at IPO uh, generated a yield of 37%, and last pre-IPO financings generated a yield of 270%, a 7.3 times multiple. So highly compelling. In terms of our criteria, um, uh, we target a minimum uh, valuation of a billion dollars per company. And in fact, our portfolio is, um, uh, has an average of $4 billion per company. Um, we seek companies with a trading life of a minimum of five years, with an aspiration to IPO in the near to medium term. And they must be in the fourth industrial revolution space or uh, be disruptive innovators. Uh, with compelling moats and high barriers to entry. In terms of our track record, we're already in this space um, through a portfolio of 20 investments. Our main sectors are software as a service, financial technology, otherwise known as fintech, data analytics, uh, cloud infrastructure, biotech, cybersecurity, and food and agro technology. We made these investments in the last in last quarter of 2019, so two and a half years ago, and we've achieved nine exits, yielding a gross realized return of 267% on these exits and a 71% gross realized return on the overall portfolio. <coughs> so our addressable market, um, bearing in mind that one of our criteria is only targeting companies valued, private companies that is, valued at a billion dollars or more. This gives you, this pie chart gives you a, an indication of the international spread and uh, as you can see, the majority uh, is in the US uh, at 51%. In second place is China and Hong Kong at 18% and the rest um, is fairly sp evenly spread amongst the rest of the developed world. Now in terms of private market scale, um, there have been significant developments. Uh, in 2018, the number of unicorns or private companies valued at a billion dollars or more was 260 worldwide. That uh, represented a market cap of $900 billion and that has since grown to tw in 2021 to 762 companies representing a market cap of uh, $2.4 trillion. And moving on to private market assets under management, uh, in terms of Morgan Stanley's research, they estimate that in 2021, private market assets under management was valued at $7 trillion, and they're forecasting a 13% compounded annual growth uh, rate of uh, you know, private market assets to grow to $13 trillion by 2025. So highly compelling growth. This slide represents, uh, is a visual representation of our addressable market. All of these companies are beneficiaries of uh, pre-IPO secondary market investments. Some have gone on to list, and, and some of those names that you would be familiar with are Tesla, Uber, uh, Robinhood, and, um, and Palantir. Um, the rest, as I say, are aspiring to move into the, the listed space in the near to medium term. So aside from immediately available pre-IPO investments, um, we as uh, Jaltech are in a position to reserve interest for pre-IPO investments that will become available in the near to medium term. And as such, we have reserved interest to invest in a number of names, including Databricks, Klarna, Chime, and Netscope. And why we've uh, identified these is because we believe these will proceed to listing uh, still within 2022. In terms of co-investment rights, investors in the platform also uh, have the right to co-invest uh, in specific or individual assets that they so wish, and bespoke arrangements can be made. Uh, co-investments will have um, 
will be Paripasu or have Paripasu rights with the uh, platform and um, co-investments will be subject to thresholds. And one of the most common questions we get asked um, is what is our exit strategy because these are private assets um, and perceived to be illiquid. And the overwhelming mechanism that we see is public listing by IPO, initial public offering, and a, and a significant minority through direct public offerings. But that said, the secondary market has developed significantly uh, in, in 2020 and 2021 to the extent that allocated capital worldwide for private assets is estimated to be $2.5 trillion. So this represents a significant and very deep market uh, to exit into. And then the last mechanism we see is, you know, ordinary M&A activity through a corporate takeover. Uh, a summary of our key terms, uh, specifically for retail investors, is our geography, as mentioned, is primarily in the US, um, but we are looking at other developed markets. Um, the instruments we invest in are really just uh, shares, uh, common stock and preferred stock. Our target sectors are the fourth industrial revolution sector and disruptive innovation companies. Our current target raise for retail is four million dollars. The target number of initial investments would be 10 but we think realistically we'll achieve a, a double that. And our exit pipeline is a maximum of five years but we believe we'll start exiting even in the first year of, of investment. Our target returns are north of 25% in US dollar terms. And our minimum commitment uh, is $50,000, which is very modest considering uh, the typical domain um, uh, entry level for this sort of asset class. All of our companies would have ESG policies or frameworks in place, and the currency of investment would be in US dollars. So to summarize it all, uh, our platform offers offshore pre-IPO exposure, as mentioned, a difficult asset class to get exposure to. We offer the opportunity to co-invest with the world's leading venture capital and private equity investors, targeting high returns at a low minimum investment. And these are our contacts, and we welcome further engagement. Roberta, thank you very much. It reminds me of that old joke in private equity. How do you spot a general partner who walks into the room? They're the first ones looking for the exit. And I mean, it is a big part of the private equity strategy. You've got to know not only what asset you're buying into, but how you're exiting that. So to see the nine exits, I think, is seriously impressive. We've really just got time for, for one question. Mm. How do South African investors actually get access to these assets? How do you get access to these assets? Well, a, a few years ago, we saw the opportunity to, to buy in through uh, specifically, in, mainly in the US market. Um, and there are platforms available for retail investors. There have to be qualified investors, which we are one. And we are packaging a platform for specifically for South African investors, uh, typically retail, but we are looking to expand into the institutional space as well. Um, and so we have the, the ability to package these for South African investors. And you know, the, the uh, levels that we're looking at investing are well within the sort of exchange control limits. Mm. Uh, we're also considering the changes to Regulation 28, which I think is quite exciting for, for the space as well. And so really, um, if investors are interested in further information, please do contact us. Absolutely. And if you're looking to, as you say, take advantage of those increased allocations to offshore in an environment where pre-IPO private markets are, are certainly growing exponentially, yeah. uh, then that's the way to do it. That was Roberto uh, Ferreira of Geltec Equity Capital Investments explaining the opportunity set in pre-IPO investments. Stay tuned to the 2022 Alternative Marketplace. Welcome back to the 2022 Alternative Marketplace, Africa's home for the top investment managers in the alternative asset class space. Well, we've just heard from Geltech Digital Investments, which is opening up and making the world of uh, digital investing more accessible than ever before. Next up is Brian McMillan, Investec Structured Products. Now, Brian has been involved in the market uh, for more than 25 years, first as a stockbroker and then sales of equity derivatives before joining the Structured Products team at Investec, where he listed the first structured products on the JSE. Brian, over to you. 
Thanks very much. Um, yes, as we mentioned, uh, we have been doing structured products for a number of years. In fact, um, Investec has been doing these for 20 years now. Our first uh, structured product was listed back in, in 2002. Um, and that was on one of our offshore structures. We've subsequently done uh, over 175 uh, public launches. Um, fortunately, none of those have ever, ha ever had an actual loss. So we've returned capital in almost all those cases. And in fact, 91% of them have returned a, a profit at the end of the period. Um, we, we get asked, I suppose, uh, and uh, having done so many of these, you know, the three questions that we do get asked is, do you need capital protection? A lot of asset managers uh, say to us, you know, if you stay long enough in the market, uh, you don't need capital protection because the market will grow. But of course, people don't invest like that. They don't invest uh, age 20 and, and hold it until they're 65. A lot of people um, are investing in different things at different times. And of course, we have the whole uh, universe of alternatives nowadays. Um, and what we found is that the value of capital protection has become very valuable in this time when people are chopping and changing. Uh, one of the most important things, I think, for, for capital protection, it allows a person to stay invested in the market when normally they would be going, uh, I should probably come out the market, the market looks a little expensive. Certainly at the la end of last year, the market looked expensive. Um, if you have that capital protection over some of your uh, investments, you can stay in. And of course, in South Africa, we also have the problem of a lot of people being underinvested. And when they start approaching the age where they should be switching from equity into bonds, they, haven't, they ha actually haven't built up that nest egg enough. And we're seeing a lot of people use structured products to actually remain invested in equity products because they have that level of capital protection. So uh, in this slide here, I have a, uh, just an example of one of our products. This was in 2007 that we, we launched this product. Uh, just before the, the market uh, had the uh, global financial crisis. And what you can see here is it was actually a basket of a, a couple of different indices put together, the FTSE, the S&P, um, and the MSCI world. And at one point, that index had fallen by over 50% in the middle of the crisis. Um, the blue line that you can see there is what our product did. So even though you had a five-year product which promised you 100% capital guarantee at the end of the period, um, even though the, the market had fallen over 50%, our product never actually printed, uh, never traded, but the, the bid offer price that we had never traded below, below 89%. Um, or 89 percent of the original and you can see over time it actually grew back so what that allowed people to do is actually to to hold through that period even when they were uh, concerned about the the market itself and in fact um, we actually went back to the market at this time um, you know in 2010 and said look the market has fallen over 40 percent um, you can actually get a 93% back for your product. Would you like to re-strike it? And a lot of the people actually did that, uh, took a, a small loss, a 7% loss, but re-put the money back into the market when it was 40% down. So we've certainly seen the value of capital protection there. And certainly in times like we are at the moment where the market is very high, PEs at the end of last year on the, the US market were an all-time high before for pulling back, but it allowed people to stay in the market, that level of capital protection. Um, another area I wanted to talk about is outperformance. So not only are we getting um, capital protection in our structured products, but a lot of our structured products actually outperform the market. And this is because um, when you buy a structured product, you can actually get downside protection, but geared upside. Now, in these two graphs, we're showing our, our Guernsey products. We call them our Guernsey products, which is our offshore investors. Um, and they've actually outperformed the market over this 20-year period um, by giving a, an average annual return of uh, over 4.5%, whereas the market itself has given 1.7. And how we do that is through this gearing. Our JSE listed products, which are a combination of not only RAND, but also um, 
uh, offshore because we now have the ability to inward list have actually done even better and and I suppose that's because they've only been running since twen uh, 2010 so the markets have been much better but again we've been able to outperform there and that the two major reasons why we've been able to outperform is because we have these two types of products the first one is a digital product and what that means is that if the index is flat or positive you get a fixed return and that fixed return is set up front so if uh, you in enter into a three and a half year product over the euro stocks in this example and the index ends slightly positive or even highly positive over the period, you will always get that digital return. In this particular case, the investor got a 50% return in RAND. Plus, if the index is actually up more than 50% over that three and a half year period, the investor got the full upside beyond 50. And in many cases, we saw uh, th through the early 2010s, 11, 12, when Europe was having its banking crisis, those indices although they initially fell they ended up two three four percent after three or four years and these investors were getting that 50 percent and that's where you were getting that outperformance uh, the other structure that we have here um, is one that's about to expire it's a top 40 index um, and what we did is on the downside we gave 20 percent protection so if the index fell 21 percent the investor would lose one but on the upside if the, if the index moved up, they were getting one and a half times whatever the index did. And that was capped at 40%. But what you can see is if you get a one and a half times the gearing to a 40% cap, uh, if the index goes up more than 40%, you're getting a 60% return. And that's really how people can get gearing or outperformance to the actual market um, by using these structured products. The the next question that we always get asked is, when is the right time to enter the market? And I suppose that is the hardest one. Uh, certainly, as I, I mentioned, the markets have been high. Uh, we've got inflation coming through. We're going to have um, you know, increases in interest rates. And that generally has been a time when markets have underperformed. And certainly off these high levels, and again, we have these people who you know, want to be in the market, they need to be in equities to try and get those returns. And so we have a number of strategies for that. One of the most um, obvious example is an auto call. So an auto call essentially gives the investor a structured product over a five year period. Um, but each year we look at that, the, the price of the index. If it's flat or positive, the investor gets a set fixed return. In this case, uh, this is over the uh, Eurostox dividend select. If the index is flat or positive after year one, the investor will get a 10% return in US dollars. If it's not, and, and the market is indeed down, it looks a further year out into year two. Uh, in this example, we show that the market's down in year uh, one, two, in year three it's up, and the investor will actually get a 30% return in US dollars. So what, what that means is that you have this structured product which is normally set for a set period, but now we've put it into chunks. So each year it has a chance where it can actually expire and give an investor an almost cash plus type return. Um, and that's important for people that are looking for uh, ways to invest in the market when the market is high. You want those ability to ab able to lock in any profits that you get along the way. Uh, with all our structured products, uh, we like to do this back testing. Obviously, it doesn't mean that this is going to hold in the future, but um, when we looked back across our, our auto calls, we looked back and said over a period of 14 years, uh, which is through the global financial crisis, through a pa pandemic, what happened to that index if you, if you bought one of these products on each of those days, going back to 2008? And what we found is that a lot of these products call in year one. In fact, um, the Eurostox dividend select, uh, over 65% of the time it called in year one. In year two um, and year three, obviously much less so. But I think the important thing here is that in only 10% of the time uh, was the index down for more than five times. Um, and in other words, at the end of five years, the index had never been positive on any of those years. And what we found there is that the investor was getting their cash back. So they had capital protection at that point. 
The only time they didn't have capital protection is if the index was down more than 30%. And in fact, that happened in less than 2% of the cases. All of those cases, incidentally, were if you'd bought them in 2005, 6, and 7, and when they expired in 2008, the market had been down uh, over that five year period. So that's really the three things that I want to talk about. The first is the value of that capital protection allows people to stay in the market longer than they would have. Um, the ability to outperform on the upside, so they have alpha, they have, um, they have uh, exposure to the market, but they have geared upside. And that gearing doesn't mean they have geared downside, it just means that the upside is geared. And then uh, these auto calls or um, other types of products that actually almost almost look like a cash plus enhanced return when markets are uncertain, which they certainly are at the moment, um, then investors can still invest in the market because they have those five different chances to to actually receive a return. Uh, thank you, Brian. And unsurprisingly, they are quite popular at the moment. Are you seeing much institutional interest in these kinds of products? So over the last four or five years, we've certainly seen uh, people coming into the market who actually bought our structured products as a retail side asset managers and are now using them in the um, in this space of uh, normal active asset managers. And I think it's really because of that, those kind of uh, skewed returns where you can get geared upside and, uh, and protection on the downside. Uh, certainly we're seeing more of that. And in terms of the future of, of the space, I mean, you listed the, one of the first ever structured products in the country. What do you see as the future? So I, I think um, what we're going to see is these become more and more commoditized. At the moment, they're sold through IFAs, they're sold through wealth managers. Um, I think over the next few years, we're going to see these arrive on platforms. Uh, you're going to be able to, to choose you know, different indices, different levels of capital protection, different levels of gearing. But I think that's further down the line. You know, South Africa tends to, to be behind in that kind of thing. We catch up very quickly when there is a new idea. But I think uh, the move to platforms is, is something that's going to happen in the next few years. And then also this continual shift towards offshore markets. Brian McMillan, thank you very much. Uh, Investec Structured Product uh, with a deep dive into the structured product environment. Uh, gives you that capital protection, uh, geared upside, and, uh, and certainly a way to access markets uh, during times of extreme uncertainty, which is really where we are at the moment. Three Six One is an asset management company with a 16-plus year track record of exceptional performance. They manage unit trusts, hedge funds, and segregated mandates with over 32 billion rands in assets under management. And our speaker today is Stephen Hervitz, who is an investment analyst with Three Six One. He's been with the firm for uh, over five years, and Stephen placed fifth nationally in the Psyker board exams and is a CFA charter holder. Stephen, over to you. Thanks, Michael. Um, so it's great to be here and just uh, introduce everyone to 361 Asset Management and just take you through what we do at, at the firm, uh, specifically with regards to hedge funds. So uh, we've been around for a pretty long period of time. It was started by Cy Jacobs and Steve Lips in 2005 after they left Investec. Um, and we really believe that we have one of the best investment teams in the country. So uh, it's a small owner-managed business. There are 22 uh, employees, uh, half of whom are part of the investment team. And that allows us to really go uh, in depth and understand the companies that we're analyzing and therefore take, op take advantage of the opportunity set that's available to us. So how do we uh, see uh, the outlook in, in uh, equities and how have we positioned our, our portfolios? So I think the important thing to realize is that we are transitioning from being uh, in a pandemic uh, and COVID has now become endemic uh, and all it took was a, a global invasion or a Russian invasion of Ukraine for us to forget about uh, COVID case numbers. So I think it's quite important to understand some of the themes that are going to go along with that. Uh, and we're going to see a resurgence in the consumption of energy uh, and oil specifically. So uh, we are far away away from when oil actually was negative uh, at the heart of COVID. 
uh, and now it's uh, over $100 a barrel. Uh, and one of the biggest beneficiaries, uh, or one of the only beneficiaries on the South African market is actually Sassel. So we see that as a good opportunity. Uh, we also believe there's going to be policy normalization uh, in South Africa. And lastly, we still believe there are lots of equities that are attractively priced. So there's been a huge run up in the market, but you just need to see through some of the volatility and realize that on a normalized earnings basis, uh, many companies are still trading way below their intrinsic value. Uh, British American Tobacco being a prime example of that. So how have we prepared for this kind of environment we see ourselves in now? Uh, we tend to do really well during bear markets or during market sell-offs. Uh, and we have a very good understanding of how market participants act uh, during these kind of market dislocations. So some of the things we need to do is uh, we need to uh, cut exposure. Uh, we need to hold more defensive companies, but also understand that there are certain companies that will benefit regardless of the situation that's taking place. So currently you can see that commodity companies are doing extremely well due to what's going on in Russia. Uh, and they can hedge your portfolio, even if you're long those companies, uh, they can act as a very good hedge to some of the other companies. So one very common mis misconception that we see in uh, the market is that people believe that hedge funds are extremely risky uh, investment vehicles. And unfortunately, a lot of them are risky and a lot of them are obscure in terms of uh, the, the strategies that they embark to use to make money. But in the case of 361, it couldn't be further from the truth. We are way more defensively positioned in our hedge fund than we are in our long only funds. And we pride ourselves on our ability to protect capital in market uh, corrections. So this is just an example of how we've done this in the past. Uh, as you can see, there are three different uh, market environments. The first one is when you have positive months on the JSE. The second one is when you have negative months on the JSE. And then the third one is when you combine the two. Now, because we have less exposure than the market, when the market's strongly rising, we'll never keep up with the market. But where we truly shine is when the market falls. So on, on average, when you have a negative month on the JSC, it's a down about 4%. And we're only marginally negative. Uh, and when you combine these two months, up months and down months, uh, it results in us consistently over, uh, outperforming the market to the tune of about 4.5% per annum. Just an example of what we'd do is we'd go long a company and we'd go short a similar company uh, or in the same sector. And that helps us hedge out some of the uh, sector risk and, and really focus on the company fundamentals at play. So for example, this year we were long Google, uh, which has performed reasonably well, but we paired this up with a short in a firm. And a firm is one of these buy now, pay, day, uh, pay later lenders. And this was all the rage during COVID, but we thought it was very much a fad. And there still was a significant amount of credit risk that these businesses were taking on. So while they were growing their top line tremendously, we weren't really seeing this translate into free cash flow uh, for the business. Uh, and as uh, central banks around the world spoke more about normalizing policy, uh, some of these inflated valuations came back down to earth. So why, as an investor, should you consider hedge funds? How does it fit into your portfolio? So I think the important thing to realize is that uh, by choosing a selection of different long-only funds, you're not actually diversifying. So this just says, what happens if you took a portfolio and allocated to five different South African managers, the five biggest in the country, and how would your performance be relative to the market? And as you can see over time, you actually end up underperforming the market. Uh, and part of this is due to the fees that each of these managers take. But the other part is when you have five different managers, you're actually just getting market-like performance because you're so well diversified. Uh, if you have a look at the 361 hedge fund, on the other hand, uh, our correlation to the market is significantly lower. Um, I think when you run that exercise with the top five equity funds, you end up having 92% correlation to the market, whereas we're sitting at 51%. So it brings diversification to your portfolio. Now, for a lot of investors, the way they'll go about uh, reducing risk is by having a, a bond allocation within their portfolio. So if you go and take 60% equities, 40% bonds, that's what your return metrics would look like on the left. So you'd have 
10% uh, performance, 10% volatility, and an over 20% drawdown. Now, if you swap out that portfolio and add the 361 hedge fund, uh, reduce the equity to 30% and the bonds to 10%, you end up increasing your performance by uh, nearly 4%, but on top of that, you've actually reduced your volatility. So uh, your sharp race ratio of your entire portfolio is significantly better. Now, something we often think about at 361 is just what is the risk of uh, having a drawdown in your portfolio? And mathematically, as the drawdown gets bigger, you have to recover a, significantly amount, a significant amount more. So during the COVID sell-off uh, in March 2020, uh, we were down uh, just about 1%. Uh, and to get back to where we were, we hardly had to make anything up. But for the All Share Index and for the Cap Swix, as your loss got bigger, you had to make a significantly amount uh, more money. So if you have a 50% drawdown, for example, you have to make a 100% return just to get back to where you are standing. So how does this fit in for someone's investment portfolio? And I think a great example is to show people who rely on their portfolios for income. So in a living annuity, uh, let's say you have a, a lump sum put in up front, and then uh, every month you have to take a, a salary off that, and every year that the amount that you need to draw increases by inflation. How does that work? So in the first example, this just says, okay, you put a million rand in lump sum, what do you end up with at the end of uh, the investment period? Uh, and as you can see, your, your money in the hedge fund is worth 87% more uh, than if you had just invested in the market. But you also would have had much lower volatility uh, along the way. But where it truly shines is the example where the person is taking an income. And the income uh, that you're taking results in you having 137% higher ending portfolio value. And the reason for this is that when you have a market correction, you're still required to take an income. So now what's happened is you've taken an income uh, and it becomes a larger percentage of the portfolio that you're drawing. And then just to get back, you have to earn significantly more. So for investors that are re relying on drawing an income from their, from their portfolios, uh, having a conservatively positioned hedge fund uh, as part of their portfolio results in much better return metrics and helps you sleep at night as well. Well, Stephen, thank you very much. I mean, uh, there, there are a couple of questions I want to get in, uh, so I'm just going to dive in because we are running out of time. Sure. When you're positioning a hedge fund during a time like this, huge geopolitical uncertainty, how does that factor into the way you're positioning your hedge fund? So I think the important thing uh, for us, well, at least a lesson that we've learned, is that you can't take bets on 50-50 outcomes. So uh, whether it's an election uh, or Brexit, for example, uh, the risk is too big that you position your portfolio one way. Um, but in the case of what we're doing now uh, with Russia, it's better just to reduce your risk and reduce your risk before the outcome happens. Mm. Unfortunately, what happens is if you decide to uh, be reactive and only do it after the event has taken place, then you already have lost the money and then you're locking in that loss. So for us, it's about evaluating various probabilities and then trying to understand how your portfolio will react to those probabilities. Uh, and if you realize you don't have a significant edge in determining what the geopolitical outcome would be, it's much better just to reduce risk on both sides so that when thing, the dust does settle, you have the capital available to take advantage of the opportunities that will present itself. Absolutely. And then, yeah, I mean, so what you effectively saying is hedge funds are great risk mitigation tools and, and, and strategies to employ in a diversified portfolio. Often they're viewed, though, hedge funds as risky themselves. Why is that? Why, why do you think that market perception exists out there? It is because there are risky hedge funds out there. Um, there have been multiple hedge funds over the years that have blown up or uh, significantly impaired their client portfolios. Uh, two that come to mind in the last two years is Melvin Capital in the US, mm -hmm. who, who was running a short book which was way too big and too illiquid okay, for them stop. to do anything about. Exactly. Uh, and the other issue is that some hedge funds call themselves hedge funds, but they're not really hedging anything. They're just taking on a lot of leverage uh, and going long stocks at like two, three, four times the mm. uh, actual value of the capital in the, in the fund. And that's an example of Archegos, uh, which blew up uh, at the beginning of 
2021. I think a great example of why not all hedge funds are created equal and why investors should be asking those kinds of questions. Stephen Hurwitz, investment analyst uh, with 361 with the ins and outs of hedge funds here at the 2022 Alternative Marketplace, Africa's home for the top investment managers uh, in the alternative asset class space. Welcome back. You're with the Alternative Marketplace, Africa's home to the best investment managers in the alternative asset class universe. Now, cryptos have had a wild ride over the last 12 months. Uh, uh, breaches of $3 trillion total market cap and then sinking back below $2 trillion. But some say the volatility is just all part and parcel of the cycle of this new asset class. Well, John T. Sachs is a partner at Geltech. It's a boutique alternative uh, investment fund manager. Uh, and John T. is an admitted attorney, having previously acted at Edward Nathan Sonnenberg's uh, and at uh, Geltech as well. John T is responsible for driving growth and they've got a very interesting new uh, crypto product that they've brought to the market. John T, over to you. Michael, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I think just to cast a little bit more light on Geltech, so we are alternative investment managers and really what we do is we produce um, alternative products which typically have a higher yield or return profile that you generally find in the traditional markets. Um, we've been around for a number of years, we manage over 1.6 billion rand, so we're really an established player in this market. But interestingly, in the crypto space, within about 18 months, we've already seen 1.5 billion rand worth of crypto trades go through our business. But today I'll be discussing Joltec's cryptocurrency basket. And really what it is, is this investment uh, where our investors get exposure to a diverse range of cryptocurrencies. And basically, as, it, as its name says, it's a diverse basket. And really what the, op the opportunity is, is investors don't need to research the market, understand the market, or monitor the market. That's our responsibility. Um, what's really exciting and a key characteristic about the basket is, in essence, it matures as the market evolves. And that's a really important point because this is a really fast-growing market. And um, the basket uh, has nine cryptocurrencies at the moment, and we'll go through them. But if certain market events happen, Cryptos may be removed from the basket or added into the basket. And we believe that's what investors should be investing into is a diverse basket that's managed. And why? Because it's really such a fast growing um, ecosystem. Cryptocurrencies are really growing at a huge rate, faster than the in internet at the moment. Now, this is very different to what else is in the market. The market has a number of baskets which are static. Top 10 cryptocurrencies by market cap. We're not playing in that game. We have key characteristics that we weigh against the market, and that will affect what's in our basket. Now, to give you kind of an analogy is if you invested in the tech space five years ago into a basket, you, you would have exposure to Facebook, Amazon, Tesla. But due to COVID, the market's really changed, and now these tech baskets have added the likes of Netflix, the likes of Zoom, because these investments have done, or businesses have done really well. And that's what we're doing in the crypto space. As new cryptocurrencies, do really well, gain adoption, utility, we add these to our cryptocurrency basket. Now, we've gone through a huge filter process. There are over 15,000 cryptocurrencies in the market. We've applied our key characteristics against the market, and that has really produced nine cryptocurrencies, which will form part of our basket. Now, the number of characteristics, and just to give you a sense of what they are, we only invest in cryptocurrencies that have at least a market cap of $2.5 billion. Now, there are lots of benefits by, by investing into large cap cryptocurrencies. One being, it's very unlikely that within a short period of time, they'll go to zero. But most importantly, pre-regulation, we think that it's a good investment to make. Why? Because when financial institutions like pension funds um, invest into cryptocurrencies when regulations are introduced, we are confident that the large cap cryptocurrencies will get the bulk of those investments. These large uh, pension funds are not going to be investing into speculative small cryptocurrencies. They're going to be investing in the large players. And that's why we think that this basket is really positioned well in, in the SA and, and global market. Other key characteristics are we'll only invest into cryptos that are really available globally on multiple exchanges and are traded in high volumes. And this is important to us because we really want to offer our investors um, an option of exiting within a really short period of time. Currently, within three business days, we can exit our investors. Another key characteristic for us is security and custody. 
We don't like taking ex um, cryptocurrency exchange risk. We've developed one of, the, we believe, one of the best institutional grade custody solutions. We've partnered with one of the biggest custody tech providers globally. They've already seen $3 trillion go through their business. And we really believe that our solution will, pr will protect our investors' um, cryptocurrency against hacking and cyber attacks, et cetera. This is just some of the characteristics that we use um, and apply against the market to really develop what we think is a really brilliant set of cryptocurrencies. Now, if you look at our basket, it is diverse. We have got cryptos which form part of the digital currency basket, being those that are looking to compete with the likes of the dollar or the rand or the yen. And these are the Bitcoins of this world, the Litecoin. Bitcoin, you know, over the last five years has experienced returns of 5,000%. Um, we've also got cryptocurrencies which are in the blockchain environment. Ethereum, its market cap is around $450 billion. These are serious, serious players. Solana, Polkadot, Polygon, all playing within the backbone of cryptocurrencies being the blockchain network. And then we have what is referred to as layer two, or protocols, or colloquially, businesses that are using blockchain as, as its backbone. We've got Aave, Uniswap, and Chainlink. To give you a kind of sense of these cryptocurrencies, Aave is a decentralized, effectively a bank, where if you hold cryptocurrency, you can deposit it on their protocol. You can either earn interest from the deposit, or you can um, deposit and use that as collateral to um, enter into a loan arrangement for, for funding from this protocol. Now, this might sound completely foreign to many people, but already $250 billion has been invested or deposited with Aave. $50 billion is already in the market in the form of loans. And amazingly, this protocol has no employees. It's completely automated, coded, and it works, and it's been working for a significant period of time. And these are the type of uh, cryptocurrencies that we have in our basket. We really think that these types of investments is the future of cryptocurrency. Unfortunately, um, the South African crypto market has had a few rotten apples. We have the MTRs of this world, the Africrips of this world. So we know that our investors need to have comfort that they are dealing with really reputable fund managers. So we've appointed the likes of BDO as our auditors. The structure of the vehicle or the investment is a public company. We chose this over a private company because a public company has more reporting requirements, more transparency and accountability. The issuing instrument is a debenture, which uh, falls under the FECA's category 1.10, and that should give investors another level of comfort. And ultimately, you are dealing with a fund manager that already manages 1.6 billion rand. In terms of investment highlights, our minimum investment is only 50,000 rand. We have a debit order uh, option for investors who want to trickle their investment in over a period of time. We provide monthly statements so investors can monitor their returns or they can see the daily price of the performance of our basket on our website. But ultimately, you're investing with us because you want a diversified basket of cryptocurrencies. If you, in addition, want diversification, um, we also have a Bitcoin option where you'll have exposure to Bitcoin or Ethereum or both or all three, depending on your needs. How to invest? Well, it's pretty simple. You go onto our website. Um, you navigate to the cryptocurrency basket, complete a really simple form, and within a short period of time, you will um, have exposure to this asset class. Thank you very much. If you would like to get a hold of me, uh, my details are on the screen. And uh, also just to remind uh, viewers as well that they can go and uh, click on uh, the presentation tab on, uh, on the event site and they can contact you directly through that as well. Now, it's, a, okay. it's amazing how, and I often look at the last 12 months as being a watershed year for cryptos because of the, uh, the public attention and how mainstream it's become. Within that context, who should be investing in cryptos and how much would you be advising to allocate to a well-diversified portfolio? I think anyone whose portfolio can manage some risk. You know, I think obviously depending on age and personal circumstances, but the majority of us should have some risk in their portfolio. And that risk portion of your portfolio should have a moderate risk section and a high risk section. If you, whatever you're allocating to high risk, you should consider cryptocurrencies. And the amount, it's really dependent on the person, but I would imagine between one and 5%. Mm. And I say this because this is really one of the few asset classes in, in, in the world where you can invest 1% of your portfolio with a potential over 3 to 10 years for that to become 10% or more of your portfolio. 
But conversely, if it goes to zero, you'll still be able to sleep well at night, no, you know, having the only lost 1%. But it's the risk versus reward profile of this investment where you know, there aren't any comparisons currently in the market. And why would someone go through this basket versus going through one of the exchanges that are well known in the country? The, the, the question really is around allocation, which cryptocurrencies? So a lot of investors are investing into cryptocurrencies because a mate of theirs mentioned it or someone made a lot of money off, off it. But they really don't understand this market and they're gambling. Where we are in the game every single day, um, we've got a team who are focusing on cryptocurrencies and we make decisions not based on gut feel and emotions, but based on a criteria that we've established. And um, you know, if you're not a savvy investor and um, you know, you're not going to be watching the market every minute or every hour. You mm. probably want someone who's, who's seasoned in the game to manage your money. Mm. And uh, what I like about the diversified approach is it, it's very difficult, I think, early on in an industry to pick winners. Uh, sometimes it's good to be a, a fast follower, and especially in a fast moving dynamic space like this. Uh, when you look at the profile of your typical investor, uh, what do they look like? What, what does the typical investor look like? Yeah, you know, uh, our investors vary. But ultimately, uh, the segment of the market we, we focus on is your more senior investors, you know, between the ages of 40 and upwards. And you know, we've attracted majority of our investors through uh, financial advisors. We work very closely with all the, lo the large institutions and even the smaller guys. Mm. Uh, and we assist their clients in, in investing in cryptocurrencies because it's not really their game. It's unregulated and it's fast moving. But we also have a significant number of direct investors who don't want to and have to research and understand the market and guess and gamble. So there, it's, uh, there it varies in the region of, we've got a number of 35 year olds, but predominantly our investors of, of 40 years and up. Yeah, yeah, and that, uh, it's interesting to hear you say that juxtaposed to some interesting stats uh, that I read from Luno the other day, and that the average investor is about in the mid 30s, I think, investing 450 Rand, it sits there and they don't do anything with it. This is a product that's really designed uh, in such a way to give you the maximum chance of seeing that one to go to uh, 10x. So uh, very interesting. John T, thank you very much. That was uh, John T. Sachs, partner at Geltech, uh, Boutique Alternative Investment Fund Manager. We head now into the world of venture capital with Clive Butko. He's uh, the founding principal of Kalon. Kalon Venture Partners is a venture capital company that invests in digital disruptive technology. Uh, Kalon invests in post-revenue startups with high growth and high impact potential who are solving African problems. Clive is uh, the former chief operating officer of Accenture South Africa and has uh, 28 years management consulting experience. During his tenure at Accenture, he spent time building tech businesses in uh, most of the tech on entrepreneur ecosystems around the world, including Silicon Valley, India, and the UK. With that, uh, Clive, over to you. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. So yes, as Michael said, I was the ex-CEO of Accenture South Africa, and I retired nine years ago and uh, failed retirement, and then really wanted to do my passion, which was helping entrepreneurs build their businesses. So for many years since I left, I formed and um, started as CEO of Kalon Venture Partners, which is a digital disruptive uh, technology fund. We invest in growth capital, and uh, my background, just uh, as well as Accenture, is a, I had a, did a computer science and, and maths degree, and then during my Accenture days, I headed up Accenture's technology business, I headed up Accenture's sales business, and I headed up many parts of Accenture's business until I became the CEO and then retired at the end of 2012. So I'm gonna to talk today really about what, what, we, what we are trying to do. We've got two funds which we started six years ago, Fund one and then fund two about two years ago, and now we're in the process of raising fund three. So I'm going to talk to you today why we believe Kalon Venture Partners is a very uh, lucrative place to invest your capital for a longer term, higher risk, but higher return type of rewards. So firstly, let's talk about our vision. Our vision is to be the number one tech venture capital company investing in African entrepreneurs solving African problems. Now, yes, we invest in Africa. We invest in South Africa at the moment, and we, with our new fund, we'll go into Africa. But really what we're trying to do is not just solve African problems. We're trying to solve problems that are global problems. And you see most of the companies I'll talk about now, really, we have, not, we have solved South African problems, but now we're scaling them all over the world. And I'll talk more about that now. So it's not about, I'm the CEO, but I'm surrounded by an unbelievable board of over 200 years experience 
of building and selling businesses. You've got people like Gil Ovid, who sold the Creative Council for around a billion rand. You've got people like uh, Gil Sperling, who's on our board, who's our IC chairman, sold his business for a few hundred million rand. You've got Nicholas Liebman, who's the CEO and founder of Calio Capital, who was one of our seed investors into our fund. And I won't go through everyone, but you can go through that board and it's a board of really high profile, unbelievable experience, technology knowledge, business knowledge, and connections, not only in South Africa and Africa, but all around the globe. So what do we do? You've all heard about, we invest in tech, tech companies. We don't invest in technologies. We invest in tech companies that solve business problems. But the technologies they use, or as you'll, you've probably all heard about Web 3.0, and you've heard about the metaverse, and you've heard about uh, blockchain, and you've heard about artificial intelligence and machine learning and augmented reality. A lot of our companies use those technologies to solve the problems that we are solving in South Africa and around the world. We understand these technologies. We understand the impact on the metaverse over the next five to 10 years. We understand why we should invest in those companies now and not only just the older companies that, are in the, that were in Web 2.0, but we folk, we, we're in a world now of Web 3.0. So just quickly, we, as Michael said earlier, we invest in growth capital. We do make some exceptions and invest in early stage uh, companies. So at least they've got a team, they've got a product, and they've got a, a few customers we'll invest in. But normally our investment is lower risk than that. We invest in companies that are looking for growth capital, that have got 10, 20, 30 clients, they're doing half a million, a million a month, and we'll really put fuel in the gas. So we know that they're, they're at the point of scalability and they just need capital to scale their businesses in terms of marketing and sales. And that's where we focus our capital, to de-risk our investors. And I'm going to talk no, more about now some of the companies that are in our portfolio. So the first company I'm going to talk about, and, and, I, hope, and I hope many of you have used Ozo. Ozo is a payments company. You can use it uh, at the point of sale when you pay for something. You can use it when you go to take a lot and, and you use the EFT option, electronic funds transfer. But what's interesting in South Africa, there's 48 million people or with, with bank accounts or 40 million bank accounts and only 7 million credit cards. So currently when you go and pay and take a lot, you offered the option of, of a credit card, but you also offered the option of electronic funds transfer. And that's what, that is what Ozo does. Peer-to-peer -peer payments, uh, as I said, it can do it at the, the electronic funds at the point of sale as well. So you can see there from the numbers, so Ozo's been going for a number of years. We invested about three years ago when we invested the company was about 15 million and about 15 people. The company is now an order of magnitude, more like 10x what, what we had invested in, and roughly about 90 people, and should be closing this year at about 200 people. You can just see there from the numbers, we've, we do about 11 million transactions a quarter, 11 million. So this is a, one of the biggest payments companies in South Africa, and hopefully soon to be one of the biggest payments companies in Africa, competing with the likes of Flutterwave and other companies like that. We've also done, if you look at the gross merchant value, so that's the value of transactions that go through the platform, and we're doing a couple of billion rand per month that are actually going through the platform. Just I want to close off with Ozo slide. Is very recently we did a very big raise. You might have seen that in the press. We raised $48 million dollars from both global and local investors. The lead was Tencent, who, who led the round, and we also had some very, very high-profile venture capitalists from America that came into the round. I can't mention them yet because it is still confidential. But Ozo really is one of the, 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 the crown jewels for us, and uh, we've, we've made a 7 8 return on our capital since we invested in the company. The next company I'll talk about quickly is Snap and Save. Everyone likes loyalty. If you go to Pick and Pay, you'll use their loyalty card. But what Snap and Save is different, it's not a pick and pay loyalty or clicks loyalty or discam loyalty, it's a loyalty card for anyone. So the, not the big retailers, the second tier retailers, the fast moving consumer goods, anyone who wants a, a loyalty program can use Snap and Save. We've got many, many clients, we, had, we were hit quite badly at, uh, during COVID, but we've, re, re, we've regrouped, recovered and we're back to about a 30 million rand uh, per annum company based on a 2.5 million rand uh, revenue run rate. We've got 19 partnerships with a number of companies and doing a number of proof of concepts with a number of other companies. So once again, a loyalty is something you all want, whether you're saving five rand, you're saving 100 rand or 200 rand, everyone wants today, it's the time of the time, sign of the times, we want to be uh, rewarded with, with a loyalty payment. The third company is a FinChat bot. FinChat bot is a conversational artificial intelligence bot, which allows companies to uh, work directly with their, with, with their consumers in buying their products. 
This, this is a company we've, re, <coughs> we've taken out and re-domiciled it in Luxembourg. The CEO is now working in Europe. We've raised quite a bit of capital in Europe. Recently just closed a, a 1 million uh, euro round at, uh, at probably double, triple the valuation we initially came in and double the valuation we came in at the last round. The company should be doing in the next one or two months about 24 million rand, two, months, two million a month, 24 million, million rand annual run rate. So very, very high tech company, but using tech to solve significant problems. The fourth company is Flow. Flow is a very exciting prop tech company with entrepreneurs that have built and sold a 400 million rand business. Incredible, incredible team and solving a huge problem for agents, uh, for landlords, for tenants, and for any agency. We've got most of the big um, agencies and the big um, uh, rental agencies on our books. And what we do is we help them through advertising and marketing sell their properties or lease their properties out to the market. We have access to over 100, 100 million or 25 million people in South Africa, and the business continues to grow at over 20% month on month. Really incredible growth, and we've become a formidable business. What's very interesting now is we've now realized we're at the time for significant growth, and we're going on a capital raise at a significantly higher valuation, and we're raising 10 to $15 million. The next company, again, a very exciting company, is Senmark. Uh, Senmark is a cyber security company, and we all know that cyber security is a big play uh, in South Africa and around the world. Another company that's growing at over 20% month on month, and we're currently raising between uh, probably about a $10 million raise into Senmark. Since we invested two years ago, the, the, the company has grown about 1,000%. And again, raising at a significant amount, which will be a significant return to our shareholders. Second to last is Mobis, which is a digital marketing company. We grew from 16 million to 64 million last year, and now we've just raised over $4 million for our American rollout. The company is domiciled in Delaware. We've re-domiciled it in Delaware, and we're starting to roll this out. We've got 200 initial customers in the US, and now we're rolling it out to the US. We've signed Telcom, we've signed about 50 blue chip clients in South Africa, but now we're attacking the United States market. The next company is CarScan. One of the problems we all face, what does CarScan do? You want to get a quote, you have an accident, you want to get a quote to the insurance company. <coughs> it typically takes weeks to get to, uh, you have to make the claim, you then have to go to the, uh, the car dealership to get a quote. CarScan cuts us all out. It just takes, you take your camera, you use on your phone, take a picture of your car, it automatically picks up the damage using artificial intelligence, sends the quotes off to the, the, the workshops, Gives you a quote automatically. The insurance companies can then, within a day or two, you can have your, your car being ready to get fixed. This company is growing significantly. We, uh, we have got a big presence in India, Nigeria, Kenya, um, the, uh, the Middle East, and, and significant clients in South Africa as well. It's only been going for two years, and we're already at, uh, at about the 30 clients and POC mark in, uh, in car scan. Last company I'll talk about is iExperience. It's an air tech company, which is education technology. This company focuses on um, educating high school students in knowing what they want to do when they finish high school or educating college students to know what professions they want to focus on. We've got many partnerships in the U.S. and uh, we're now rolling this thing out to the, to the USA. Just second lastly is uh, if you look at the share price of our first fund, which we launched in 2016, so we've invested about 88 million, and that 88 million is currently worth 326 million based on current valuation. Our fund two, which we launched two, two, two years ago, we've invested about 40 million, 50 million, and that 50 million is worth 107 million. Significant incline or, or a significant increase in the share price to our shareholders. So we've got a significant deal flow, and that's why I'm standing out to raise capital, and we're raising capital for fund three, We've already got a commitment from an institutional investor in Cape Town for 75 to 100 million. And what we're looking for now is institutions plus high network individuals to invest a, million, a minimum of 5 million rand. And we want to close this fund in June of 2022, our first close at 150 million rand. So thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to many of you being our future investors.
And uh, we had uh, Thomas Pays on Business Watch not too long ago talking about uh, the future of payments. It uh, really is uh, the jewel in the crown of Kalon's uh, portfolio. Clive Butko, CEO of Kalon Venture Partners, a disruptive digital technology venture capital fund located in Johannesburg. Coming up after the break, we conclude with the industry organization for alternatives, certainly in the VC and private equity space, Tanya Van Lil of Savka. Stay tuned. We've just heard from Kalon Ventures. It's uh, one of the continent's top VC fund managers, and uh, you can see they're not vulture capitalists. VCs actually do have souls. So concluding for you and concluding the series, we've got Tanya Van Lil, the Chief Executive Officer of SAVCA, which is the Southern African Venture Capital and Private Equity Association. Uh, and I've known Tanya for some time since her Gibbs day. She's very passionate about the growth of the private equity and venture capital industry, given the positive impact that can be realized by investing companies and uh, advocates for increased investment to the PEVC asset class, uh, the African continent, and obviously for the ecosystem to be more supportive of entrepreneurs. Uh, Tanya, great to have you, uh, and over to you. Thank you, Michael. It's always great to be here, and great to talk about the private equity and venture capital industry, and really just giving you a snapshot of the industry. And it's great following on from Calon, um, and that I'm hoping that I can also dispel the myths that, the, that we're venture capital uh, or vulture capitals. Um, but before I get into some of the insights and the data and the st uh, statistics, I really just wanted to make sure that everyone understands where venture capital and private equity fits in. And as an entrepreneur um, embarks on their journey, there's different types of risks that they'll experience, but there's also different types of funding that they will need as they progress and as their business grows or scales. And where venture capital comes in is really at the early stages of an uh, entrepreneur's journey when they need startup or seed capital really to get their business um, off the ground and need a lot of support in terms of how do you grow and scale a business. And then as they mature, uh, private equity would then become a possible funding uh, mechanism because private equity invests in more stable, growth-sized businesses, but also write bigger uh, investment checks than venture capital. So I just wanted to make sure that uh, from a venture capital private equity perspective, they both invest in privately held companies, but they do so at different stages of a company's life cycle. But in terms of the private equity industry itself, um, what we've seen is what private equity firms are focusing on, on and where their particular um, areas of speciality lie is in f um, investing in companies and helping these companies grow. But as an organization, they too face challenges. And some of their top priorities based on the challenges they faced the last two years uh, as a result of the pandemic is really about fundraising and um, asset growth. So on the left, you'll see private equity uh, uh, challenges and priorities um, from South Africa. And on the right, it compares to priorities and challenges um, across the world from the EY Global Survey. So although asset growth is top for the international sector, uh, locally we see that it's very difficult for local uh, private equity sector, sector to actually raise funds. So what steps have uh, private equity taken to prepare their portfolio companies uh, for downturn? And a lot of the companies that they've worked with, um, it was about keeping the lights on, looking at working capital, uh, measuring their uh, runway in terms of the cash that they had available, and then strategizing and pivoting where needed, and also renegotiating contracts, whether that be with landlords or suppliers, etc. So there was a lot of hand-holding, a lot of intense um, value creation uh, for the industry. And what we can see here that it was a lot about optimizing working capital, um, it was about finding new revenue sources, and, and also looking at the risks and trying to plot what may, might happen or may happen. But we also asked our private equity firms, do they expect their operating models to transform in the next three years? And we asked for their portfolio companies, for them, and we compared it to the global um, EY survey. And what we saw is that for a lot of them, they, they're still going to uh, conduct business as usual. But they do expect, 78% in private equity expect that there'll be some form of adaptation to their operating model. And what we've seen is that for a lot of them, 
they say they're actually reviewing what they do, how they do it, and the pandemic has really opened their eyes in terms of some of the risks, uh, innate risks, and also opportunities in the industry based on changing consumer behavior. So what were the value of the funds raised in the private equity industry? So from our survey, you can see that we were surprised to see that in 2020, at the onset of the pandemic, that so much funds were actually raised. We anticipated a far lower rate of funding or uh, fundraising in terms of uh, the impact of the pandemic. So we could see 16.9 billion rand was still raised in 2020. Uh, we anticipate the number in 2021 to have been similar and we will have those results out soon. But it was good to see that despite everything that was going on, the industry was still able to raise funds and attract um, money from uh, in uh, institutional investors. But we always ask, where do these funds come from? And we broke it down from sources of funding in South Africa as well as outside South Africa. And interestingly, the past five years, we saw a lot of um, funds coming from outside of South Africa. So it used to be sort of in the 50-50% range coming from within South Africa, coming from outside South Africa. But what we're seeing now is a big turn that most of the funds raised actually emanated from within South Africa. And interestingly, it came from local pension funds. So we can definitely see there's a, a bigger appetite for local pension funds to start investing into private equity. You may also want to know which sectors received most of private equity's investment in 2020. And unsurprisingly, we saw a big investment in infrastructure. But it's not only infrastructure in the form of roads and bridges, um, et cetera. It's also digital infrastructure, s hospitals, schools. So there's a lot of um, points within the investment landscape that do touch on infrastructure. We also saw real estate, services, telecommunications, and energy and related feature within the top five. And then interesting what we wanted to show is that other is also um, just under 10%. And we, we're very surprised by other, but we feel that the other category is when it doesn't fit within a specific industry, but it touches maybe agriculture and technology, so it's agri-tech, so it won't always capture them correctly. What is top of mind for the private equity industry? So what are people talking about? They're really talking about the regulatory landscape. The, there's so many changes in the regulatory landscape that affect how they do business, where they do business, etc. So a lot of talk about changes to Regulation 28, changes to the COFI bill. So there's definitely a lot of regulatory changes that will affect the industry going forward. Also infrastructure, again, a lot of it related to Regulation 28 uh, pending changes. But we're seeing a lot of appetite for infrastructure investment, not only in South Africa, but also international investors wanting to invest um, on the African continent. The exit environment, it really depends on the health of the market uh, and whether there's growth in the market. So the exit environment has slowed down considerably. So this is definitely something that's top of mind for a lot of our fund managers that are at the point where they now have to realize investments. Um, a lot of them uh, delayed realizing investments as a result of the pandemic and just poor market conditions. We did see some exits, not as much as we would have seen in previous years. So there's definitely a, a, a need for more exit activity in the next uh, 18 to, to 24 months. There's also big discussions about ESG and impact and South Africa having been um, receiving a lot of development finance institution money uh, from European and American DFIs have traditionally formed, uh, performed much better from an ESG and impact perspective than um, our more developed markets and counterparts in the US and Europe. So they're accustomed to receiving DFI money, which is related to ESG and impact investing. But the question is, with so many uh, investors wanting to see different reporting and mechanisms, how do you harmonize, how do you report, how do you make that function um, internally more efficient, but also report back to what your investors are looking for? Creating value. That's the essence of private equity. It's about investing in companies that can grow, where they can create value. So at the end of the day, the, the company is in a much better position uh, from a financial perspective, from a job creation perspective, from the, the actual products that it offers, so that when they do realize that, in, that exit or that investment, uh, the performance is higher than what they actually bought it for. 
and then co-investments. We're seeing a lot of co-investments specifically again from the development finance institutions and these co-investments uh, re re link a lot to what their investment mandates are. So it might be climate, it might be gender, it might be agriculture. But we're seeing the need for the DFIs to do a lot of co-investments with uh, fund managers. So it comes down to the nuts and bolts. How do you do it? Um, how do you negotiate? What do those contracts and terms look like? So a lot of discussion about how do you actually make it work and make it happen. That was a little bit of a snapshot about the private equity industry. What are some of the venture capital insights and what we're seeing? We're definitely seeing growth in this industry. Um, it's, it's still a very nascent industry. It's not as mature as private equity. It's not as big as private equity. But there's a lot of appetite to invest in early stage companies and especially seeing the great innovations and quality of entrepreneurs that come from South Africa. So just over 1.3 billion uh, was invested in um, 122 entities through 167 funding rounds. So some entities uh, received more than one investment round. There's also been an increase in exits, which is really good for the venture capital industry because as the industry is still proving its mettle, it needs those exits to show that you can make a good return, uh, even in a more riskier asset class. Um, we also saw that from the number of investments year on year since 2016, it has grown. So definitely a lot of appetite, a lot more interest in the venture capital industry. What are the sectors that venture capital invest in? Um, a lot of it relates to software, business software. We saw a big uptick in fintech. Um, so that's definitely an area that's receiving a lot of attention. But South Africa being a B2B or business to business market, you can see a lot of the sectors that are receiving venture capital money um, are those that um, serve the business to business market. Although there are some really good business to consumer um, startups out there. From a investment, so what you see on the left is number of investments uh, and which sectors received most in terms of number of investments. But the sector that received most in terms of value investments was actually the agri-tech agri sector. In terms of VC investments, I just wanted to highlight this. So this is not a SAFCA survey or a SAFCA result. Um, this is from uh, Disrupt Africa and they launched it uh, a week ago. And just this just looks at what's happening at the venture capital industry on the continent. And what we can see is there's been exponential growth from 2020 to 2021 in terms of the money that's being invested on the African continent in these early stage startups. And a lot of it has to do with giving people access to products and services they wouldn't necessarily have had access to in a more efficient and cost effective way, but also in light of consumer behavior that was as a result uh, mostly of the pandemic and how people shop, where they shop, how they make decisions, access they want and need, uh, a lack of mobility mm -hmm. uh, and needing things to come to you rather than you going to it. Um, we also see on the right hand side that South Africa was listed fourth in terms of at the time of uh, the investments made 2,400 jobs of the, f the startups that received investment. And what we've seen on average between 22 and 24 percent growth in jobs for startups that receive investment. So that 2,400 figure seems small for one year. But if you multiply that and use that multiplier effect based on the growth of these um, startups, there's really an opportunity for more uh, job creation and more uh, job opportunities. Tanya, if I can just interrupt, uh, if you could wrap up the end of this because we are running out of time. Sure. So quickly, what the industry is talking about, very similar to the private equity industry. Um, fundraising, uh, what's interesting is the role of corporates, because uh, corporates can also be funders, they can be co-investors, but they can also be customers. So really, where do corporates play a role in the venture capital sector? Um, also, again, regulatory environment, a lot more collaboration that we're seeing in the VC industry. I think because it's still so small and nascent and everyone wants to see it grow. There's a lot of sharing of templates and documents and investments, etc. So a lot more collaboration. And then access to talent, um, not just for the VC industry itself, for the companies that they invest in, the investee companies, uh, find it difficult to find the right technical skills to help the companies grow. Well, Tanya Van Lille, CEO of the Southern Africa Venture Capital Association and Private Equity Association. It's always a mouthful saying that, so SAVCA. <laughs> I think it's been great having you uh, uh, present at the conference and clearly uh, as an organisation, as an industry body, doing a lot 
to promote and grow and help the regulators understand the asset class. Uh, well, that's uh, a wrap from uh, the uh, Alternative Marketplace. It's uh, been fantastic bringing you uh, all of the speakers, eight power pack presentations from the continent's top alternative asset managers. We've had Safira, Lorium, Geltech, uh, Digital Investments, uh, Investec, uh, 361. We've also had Geltech Fund Managers, uh, Kalon, and uh, the Industry Association, Savka. Remember, if you've asked a question in the chat box that uh, we haven't got to, well, uh, we're going to email email you and uh, and we'll uh, send you a full answer and also if you want us to schedule a meeting just go onto the website it's altmarketplace.co.za you can uh, schedule a meeting on the website with any of the presenters today just go and click on the presenter icon and uh, you can ensure that uh, you get to speak to them uh, about uh, your uh, uh, portfolio, your asset allocation, or, or perhaps just find out a little bit more about the area of specialization. There's just so much to digest from all of that. But if there's one take home message for me, and it's uh, probably one of the best pieces of investing wisdom that I've ever come across, it's diversification. And no, it's not a small wooden ship. It's the only free lunch in investing. So any well-diversified portfolio uh, should have a healthy allocation to alternatives, and you'll be hard-pressed to find better entry points than through one of our presenters today. From me, Michael Avery, and the rest of the, uh, the Business Day TV and Arena Events team, uh, thank you so much for tuning in, for streaming wherever you are. Goodbye, and take care.